morning, church. Happy Sunday. Great to see you. I don't know about you, but that's the highlight of my week, every week, being able to sing with you, hearing those voices just wash and feeling God's presence in the room. He is so good. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember your first love? Some of you are laughing, and some of you are smiling. I don't know if that's a good story or not. Maybe I want to hear that sometime, but uh, maybe it was puppy love. Maybe it was when you were a little middle schooler. Maybe sixth grade. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was older in life. For a young 23-year-old, Levi Bliss, he had fallen madly in love. We don't know the name of the lady in the story, but we do know that he wanted to wow her. So what he did is he, he had a big plan. I mean, after a lot of planning, he found a gorgeous scenic location among some beautiful rolling hills. And he had arranged for gigantic letters to be on the hillside, forming the words, marry me. And he just so happened to have it timed at just before sundown that he and his gorgeous honey, his, his, his girlfriend, whatever you want to call it, he had his arm around her. I can just picture driving down the road. And he just happens to stop at the scenic overlook and says, sweetie, honey, why don't we get out of the car and just enjoy this view? And she gets out and he walks over. And before she could say anything, she looks and she sees on the hillside these gigantic letters, marry me. And he gets down on one knee and he opens the ring. And just before she could reply, her father, who was aware of this, stepped up from behind the giant letters, also holding a sign that said, just say no. <laughs> True story. Now, thankfully, he was in on it and it was just a joke. <laughs> I don't know if Levi thought that was funny, but she did say yes. And it got me thinking, how awesome would it be if every question you had in life had giant letters with the answer for you? Every decision you had to make, somebody just popped out on a hillside and said, yes, or no, just say no. Not only no, but no, 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 bad, bad, don't do that. How much easier would life be if we had that kind of clarity? Like when you're looking at, at doors in your world, which one do you choose? Do you choose the one here that's, yeah, okay, thumbs up, woo, or the one that will take you to love, like Levi, or this one here that's just full of laughter and crack? I don't even know what this one is. This is kind of like a ghost door. I don't know, but what do you do when you're unsure? What do you do when you're presented with multiple opportunities? How do you know what it is that God has for you? When you come to a crossroads, you come to a fork in the road. Somebody said, well, you take the fork. Well, that's not an option. Do you go left or do you go right? Have you ever wondered what is the right path? How do you find God's calling? Today, we're going to tackle that question. And it is a great question. There's nothing wrong with asking that question and wanting God to light up your path for you. How do you know God's will for your life? How do you identify your calling? Some of you already have. Some of you are later in life and maybe you just had a calling change. Or maybe you're a middle schooler, or you're, we got a lot of youngins in here, and maybe you're wondering, you know, what am I going to do? God, what do you want to do with these hands, with this mind, with this heart? What is it that you have for me? So if you've ever asked that, you came to the right place on the right day. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings 4, if you're using a digital app, I'm going to read from the CSB translation, the Christian Standard Bible today, great translation. And while you pull that up, let me welcome our online guests and our out-of-town members. Great to have you with us. By the way, if you're a guest here, I don't say this enough, but we have a gift for you, and we would love to give that to you. If you'd stop by and see Miss Shannon in the welcome booth on your way out, and if you have a few minutes after church, I'd love to meet you. Just come down here. I'm not in a hurry. I'll stay. I'll answer any questions you have. We're just thrilled to have you here. So thank you for being here. We have a deep word from God today. Last week, you remember, as I set the context, we looked at the dangers of seeking man's approval above God's and the trap that that was. When we do our acts of righteousness to only be seen by men. Praise me, I am so good. I am proud of my humility. And we looked at that, how that is just almost an affront to God. God's saying, I'm looking for a gentle and a humble and a contrite heart. That's what's precious in my sight. Not this arrogant guy who was giving an offering. And you remember last time we, we brought up uh, Corey had this trumpet and Elias came up and it was awesome. And one of the things I didn't mention that I, I really wanted to was the reason why this offering was so long and so loud was because the hypocrites would actually go and change their gift for the largest number of coins possible so that they could stand there making maximum amount of noise 
for the maximum amount of times they drop their coins into the funnel. Can you imagine? Thankfully, I don't see any of you coming up, standing before the treasure chest, and look how spiritual I am as I make it rain into the treasure chest today. It's just, we don't have that. We come, we give cheerfully if you feel led to give. If not, that's between you and God. And that's it. And we do it right at the beginning because we don't dare enter God's presence asking for anything first without first coming as a humble worshiper and saying, God, you've blessed me. And so God is looking at the heart, and motivation means so much when you look at how Jesus talked about it. In fact, he goes on to give the admonition later about prayer. He says, go into your secret room, and after you have closed the door, and only then, then your father will see in private, and he'll reward. So as we look at the story today, the story of the widow's oil, I want to see if maybe you pick out a similarity, something about a secret place, something about closing a door. And when she does, watch what happens, because it is miraculous. Chapter 4, verse 1, read along with me. It says this, One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, has died. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Okay, talk about her husband here. He was a good man. Now the creditors are calling, and they're coming to take my two children away as his slaves. Elisha looked at her and said, What can I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? She said, your servant's got nothing. Oh, except a little jar of oil. I mean, what, what good could that possibly be? Verse 3. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all your neighbors. And don't get just a few. Then, here it is, go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all these containers. Set the full ones to one side. So she does. She leaves, and she does this. After she had shut the door behind her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers, and she kept pouring. Now imagine, she just got this little jar, right? She's thinking, how long is this going to take to pour this in? Why am I transferring this into another container? I don't, I don't understand what's happening here. She kept pouring. Verse 6, and when they were full, she said to her son, bring me another container. And he said, Mom, <laughs> there aren't any more. Look around you. I mean, this, this house is full. There aren't any more. And then, and only then, don't miss this, the oil stopped. Did you catch that? That's when the oil stopped flowing. Verse 7, she went out and she found Elisha. She told the man of God and said, here's what he said to her, go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons can go live on the rest. Wow. Man, talk about a retirement plan. Straight from the prophet. Not only does she have enough to pay the debt, there's some left over. And evidently, it's not just a teeny weeny bit. It is a lot. So we have this widow who's coming to Elisha for help. She's begging, and my heart goes out to her, and probably yours does. Her late husband has died, and evidently, he has somehow left them in debt. That's a real prospect for many of us. Think about this. The family's in debt, and to make it matters worse, the creditors are coming to take away the kids to work off that debt. He's going to put them in chains. And your kids are now mine. They're going to work off this debt. They're going to become slave for me until that debt is paid. And I love Elisha's response. She says, well, what do you got in the house? What do you have on hand? And the woman replied, I've got nothing except a tiny jar of oil. So the prophet says, go get some jars. Don't get just a few. Go to all your neighbors. And after you get these jars, I want you to go shut the door. And in private, don't miss this, in private, pour what little oil you have into all these jars. And then it happened. And that is the first lesson for us. Don't miss this. Only when she obeyed did the miracle happen. Did you catch that? When she obeyed, that's when the miracle happened. That's when the oil started to flow. The clarity of what she needed to do next was revealed when she was obedient. So pause there. Do you have a blockage in your prayers with the Lord trying to find direction? Well, ask yourself about this first step. Is there any area in your life where you know you're not quite being fully obedient to our Father? That's a powerful question. By the way, if you're a guest here, we ask deep questions. We like to get uncomfortable here. It's great. But you're safe here, okay? I promise no one's going to ask you any answers. These are just for you and the Lord and for ourselves, okay? Her breakthrough came when she was obedient. Think about this. She was able to sell all of this. And it was a private act. But God turned it around and made it a public testimony of his power and his provision for 3,000 years. We're still talking about this. 
This is so incredible. When things look bleak, all she had was obedience and a tiny bit of oil, and God opened up the floodgates and rewarded her with more than she could possibly use. The Hebrew word for oil here is shaman. It is so cool because it doesn't refer to just like oil, like put in your car. We're talking like expensive, rich, like perfume, olive oil type oil, okay? So with that in mind, think about that last verse when he says, go sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Not only am I going to take care of you, madam widow, I'm taking care of your kids. I have a college fund for them. They can go buy Krispy Kreme once a week and get a free dozen donuts. I've got, I've taken care of everything. We have front row tickets to every Alabama game. Some of you don't like that. Okay, all right, insert your team there. This is what he's saying. He's talking about a retirement plan. It's a 401k, a 403b, and a 4079er. This is all of them in one. So let me ask this. If you're at a crossroads today and you need direction, maybe you're wondering what the next step is for your life. What did you do? What do you, how do I fulfill God's calling? Let me ask you this today. What do you have in your house? Or better yet, what do you have on hand? What do you have on hand? Let me, let me show you what I mean. I just read a great ministry article just this week by Jamie Rohrbach. And in it, she wrote this. She says, I recently met with a bivocational pastor friend who had given up his secular job. So our families were sitting down, we're eating dinner, and we were chatting about what is he going to do? How is he going to provide for his What is God calling him to do? So they chatted about this, and she remembered this same story, the story of Elisha. So she encouraged her friend, get out a piece of paper and make a list of everything you have on hand. What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your home? Whether it's tangible things, whether it's skills or some kind of passion that God's given you that you are hungry for, that you're excited about, what is it? So they grabbed a pencil, and they did this. And here's what he wrote down. He said, well, I have a passion for helping people. Great. Write that down. She said, I have a willingness to learn. I'm so hungry to learn. I, I don't mind. I, I, I'm not, there's no pride here. I'm willing to learn. I don't know everything. I have experience in a secular trade. Great, write it down. I have great relationships. My family's here. They're supportive friends, mentors. I have a great network of people. And I have a love for entrepreneurship. I love to start new businesses. And boom, right as soon as he said it, they were able to look at the outliers and dismiss those because some of them didn't look like they had eternal significance. But then they saw a common theme and a light went on in his head and he suddenly realized his desire to teach and preach God's word was able to partner with his entrepreneurial spirit. And in that moment, he launched a successful business online using social media and ebooks, and is now reaching thousands of people, all because he evaluated what he had on hand. And because he did, he was willing to write it down and put in some work. He moved from feeling helpless and directionless to now having a purpose like that because he remembered Elisha's story. So if you're in that, that mode and you're wrestling right now and you're waiting for an answer, maybe you're in God's waiting room right now and it's not comfortable, Nobody likes standing in line at the DMV. Nobody likes, I mean, if you do, please see me because I want to know how you do it because it taxes me. When I go there, I make sure it is one of the times I am not wearing a potter's hand shirt. <laughs> you know, okay, you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those things. I want to list a few other questions for you to help us think, how do you find your calling? And maybe you want to write these down. More importantly, maybe you want to answer these. Maybe you want to take them home. Or maybe you've got somebody in mind right now, and you're thinking, oh, I wish so-and-so were here to hear this. This is for them, too. Write these down. The first opening question we should ask ourselves, if you could spend the rest of your life doing or talking about just one thing, what would that be? What would that be? If you could spend your life talking about one thing, something that just dominates your mind, or doing one thing, what would it be? I asked my son that this morning. You know what he said? It's easy. Minecraft. <laughs> I, would do, I would play Minecraft the rest of my life. I said, well, son, that's, maybe you have a gift at that. I don't know, but if you can make a career out of that and God's calling you, knock yourself out. When you see this, resist the urge to go all spiritual on me, okay? Because I know all of us here are good Christian people, and I know all of you in your heart want to say, if I could just talk about one, I just want to talk about the Lord and his goodness. I just want to be a blessing. To the... Listen, if you want to talk about the Lord 24-7, and, and that's what you think of, and you want, man, that's awesome. Fantastic. Come see me after church, because God's probably calling you into the ministry. And we need to go to lunch, and we can talk, and we can mentor, and we can have some great things. But I want you to be serious about this. And if that's not your first reaction, it's okay, because God can use you in many ways. Maybe you're gifted at being an artist. Maybe that's something you want to do the rest of your life, and you want to gift the world with beauty that inspires or points back to the Creator. That's awesome. Write that down. 
Maybe you're someone who's in love with learning, and you want to pour that knowledge into children or the next generation. Man, that's awesome. We need that. Write that down. Whatever it is, write it down and be open to it. Answer that question. Now, next question we need to answer. What is it that you are an expert at? What are you an expert at? Again, my son shouted out loudly, Minecraft. <laughs> that's great, son, but I don't think that's quite what we're going for. Well, you know what? Write it down. Start with that. Don't, you may not feel like what you are an expert at doesn't matter. Trust me. God's gifted you for a reason. You may not even think you're an expert at something, but your life experiences has made you an expert at something. You are better at something than I am. And the person sitting next to you is better at something in this world than the person beside you. Think about that. You are an expert. You don't have to have expertise in a traditional career. Don't just think that. Don't limit yourself. You are definitely an expert at something. For example, maybe you're passionate about stewardship or budgeting. Maybe you're good at that. Maybe you love to help people get out of debt and free themselves from those chains that tie you up and you can't even make the minimum payments and you can't think about being generous and blessing others, let alone paying for your kid's college or things like that. Maybe you have that passion. You're an expert at that and you could teach others. Boom, write that down. We need that more than ever. Perhaps you've learned by experience how to heal from trauma or how to deal with damaged emotions or you've had a tragedy in your life and God is bringing you through that dark valley and you can share that with someone else who's about to walk through a dark valley. You don't think that's needed? And you're an expert at it. You know why? Because you've been through it. Others could just read a book about it. You have walked that road. And you could share truths. You may not feel like you're an expert, but trust me, you are. People are craving what you have gained through life experience. Young people, you see someone with a, a head full of silver hair? Talk to them. Respect them. They have life experience that they can teach you. We need to esteem these who have gone before us, who have walked. Trust me, they have knowledge, and they can be a lifeline of things that we don't know anything about. The next question asked, this one seems even more generic, but it's so powerful. What do you love and what do you hate? What do you love and what do you hate? I don't even like to use the hate word, but it's important in this because often these two words are two different sides of the same coin. For example, I read about a person who was praying about their calling. And they were asked a question similar to this. And their initial, they didn't think about it, their gut-level response was this. I love powerful, happy, victorious living. Then their other one, I hate pitiful, negative, defeated attitudes. Boom! Right there it was identified. Did you catch that? That simple question helped them see that they were passionate about helping people come out of pitiful, beaten down, ho-hum Christianity and into abundant, purpose-filled living that Jesus died to give us. Do you see that? Right there in just that. And as a bonus question, if you really want to go deeper in a similar vein, ask yourself this. What is it that makes you feel alive? Something makes you tick. Something is making you grin right now because you know exactly what I'm talking about. What is it that makes you feel alive? Is it sharing God's love? Is it standing behind a pulpit with an open Bible? Is it perhaps sharing God's word with someone who's never heard? Maybe you are gifted with that almost like a a holy desire for evangelism. Maybe it's going next door. Maybe it's going to Ghana. I guarantee you, if you talk to our Ghana missionaries when they come back and ask them how they felt, they would feel alive. They were walking in their purpose, man. They were living out their calling. What makes you feel alive? Is it a great workout? (laughs) Is it going for a jog? That's not me. But if it's you, maybe you're gifted in fitness and maybe you have a passion for this and you can help somebody put down that fourth cheeseburger and start living a life that's maybe going to let them be here for their grandkids where they can love and mentor and exist longer and not just limp through life but actually go with abundance. Is it solving problems? Does that make you feel alive? I know a guy who he feels alive when he's debugging code. Okay, that's awesome. Again, that's not me, but we need people like that. Are you a problem solver? Does that that fire you up? Do you feel alive? Do you like solving people's problems who have marital issues? Maybe God's gifting you for counseling and you could share that. You didn't know that until you wrote it down. You said, oh my goodness, look at these things, how they're lining up. Do you like teaching children? Pouring your, your, your life experiences and your knowledge into the next generation and discipling them? What is it? Whatever you do that makes you feel alive, you need to write this down. Or maybe you've got somebody in your family who needs to be writing this down where you can start looking at this because it will help to simply see it in black and white. So what do you do next? 
Once you spend some time praying about this and answering these questions, you move to the next step, and you begin looking for opportunities to step out into your calling. And this is where it gets exciting, because sometimes your calling doesn't just have one door in front of you. Sometimes your calling has multiple doors. Which one do you want God to go through with you? Which one do you think he is holding open for you? So imagine this. Imagine, let's say I'm standing in front of several doors. I put on a nice suit, and I'm standing here. Okay, all right, I look a little short there. Um, April, can you help me out? Is there anything you can do to... There you go. All right, much better. That other one was some of my five nine friends. This one is where you're standing in front of the door, and you're asking God for clarity. Which one? It'd be great if you had a giant red arrow pointing over the open door. And if you read Scripture, there's some clues that almost light it up like this. How do you know if an opportunity is really from God? Because sometimes, just because you have an open door in front of you doesn't mean it's from God. It may look attractive. It may look like, mm, this, hey, I, I, this looks, I'm going right on through. And you didn't even pray about it. You didn't seek counsel. But the other token is just as true. Sometimes we don't walk through an open door because we're scared. We don't have any faith. We think, oh, I don't, that door looks a little creepy. It's a little dark in there. I'm not so sure... I'm going to say no to that one again. Yet it may have been the third or the fourth or the fifth time that God's brought that to you. So how do you know? What do you do when you're staring at three doors and quite frankly, none of them look that bad, but maybe none of them are wide open, lit up for you to go through? Cindy McMenamin wrote a great article about this. She's a respected Bible teacher, wrote numerous Christian books, and she said this. She says, I don't want to miss any open doors just because I was afraid to walk through them. But I also don't want to take every opportunity that comes along, assuming that it's God's hand that's holding the door open and his blessings will pour out from heaven on me. So what do you do? How can you tell if God is the one opening the door? The Bible gives us some clues on this. The first most obvious principle that we see over and over in Scripture is huge. Write this down. Don't miss this. The door that God opens will never contradict his word. Never. And you almost never hear me say the word never in the pulpit. This is one of the few absolutes you can cling to. God's word will never contradict something that he's asking you to do. It won't happen. You know how you know that? Because God is not the author of confusion. And God is not a hypocrite. God doesn't say one thing and do another for us. He doesn't give us confusion. For example, let's just do a hypothetical. We all know a well-meaning Christian somewhere in our past who believes that God has opened up a door for a dating relationship. Even though this person is not good for them. Even though this person is a non-believer, even though scripture is very clear about being unequally yoked, we see it right here in 2 Corinthians. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Don't do it. What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship does light have with darkness? God is not authoring that open door to go against his word. He won't contradict himself. Or perhaps you know someone who sees an opportunity to make more money. And they see the dollar signs in their eyes, and they jump at it without even batting an eye. And they go and they jump, even though the opportunity means that this job is going to take them away from their family for hours or days or weeks. Even though they take this job, even though it's going to take them away from church fellowship and being able to be around on a Sunday. Even though scripture is very clear, we see this, that the love of money can be an, an idolatrous thing. It says, don't give up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing Don't do that. He is very clear. And it is hard to imagine when you know God that he will lead you toward an opportunity that contradicts what is clearly stated in his word. That doesn't sound like the God we follow, the God who demands our best, the God who says, seek me first, and all these other things will be added to you. He will not open a door that will require you to compromise what you believe either. He will not open a door that will require disobedience from you in order for you to enter that. We don't hear that today. Today we hear, well, let's just kind of skirt the issue. God's not looking. (laughs) He doesn't know. You know what? Just do it. Just just do it. (laughs) You know anybody like that? Had some open doors? I have. I've had some sweet open doors that would be so easy for me to walk through. But until God tells me otherwise, I'm to walk on the path he's got me. We're to bloom right where he's got us planted. Oh, this is so good. There's so, so much deep. All right, so let's move on because we know that that's a temptation. That's not an open door. And God says in James, he was not the author of temptation. He's not here to tempt you. The second question to ask ourselves is know this. The door that God opens will be accompanied by confirmation. 
Oh, this is so good, so powerful. When you study Scripture, you'll see patterns. You'll start to catch a flow of how the Lord works and how he confirms things. For instance, in Matthew 18, Jesus lays out instructions for how to confront sin among the believers. We don't practice this much anymore, and it's a shame because it's laid out right here. If they will not listen, take one or two others along so that, don't miss this, every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And in your life, when you're looking for God's will, look for this pattern. You will see that sometimes you will get confirmation in his word from two or three witnesses. Those witnesses could be himself, scriptures pointing to each other, saying, this is the truth, this is the truth, this is a lie, and that is falsehood. 99% truth with 1% tainted by, by falsehood or lies is a lie. Right? We get that? So he's saying, listen for godly vice. Listen for godly wisdom. Look for things that support and confirm each other. Maybe it's a non-compromising circumstance that continues to present itself, and it comes back. Through prayer, through discernment, and reading scripture, and seeking godly counsel, you should be able to start to tell if that open door and its confirmations are from him. If you stay in it long enough, you will know if it's coming from God. Because all these things will either line up, or they'll start to contradict. And that right there will be a giant red light for you if you're truly seeking him. And the last one we see is the door that God opens will require you to depend on him. Woo! Now it's getting real. See, it's easy for us to take the, the quick road and the simple road where we got it all lined up. I don't need faith because I can see this. This dot connect to that. This, this will make me, I can provide my faith. Okay, boom. That has to be God's will. But here's the deal. God will never open a door that will allow you to be alienated from him. It won't happen. God is a God of relationship. Anything that, that allows you to feel like you no longer need him is not good because it doesn't take faith. And we know that in Hebrews, he says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. It's impossible to please him. So let me ask you this question. When you're looking at an opportunity, do you get a little bit of nervous excitement because you think this is a big deal? And I can only achieve this if God goes through this door for and, and, and lays out the road. If you're feeling that, there could be something there. Or the opposite. Man, that is a big deal. I, I, unless God goes before me, I can't do this. Oh, I not the door yet. Maybe God is stretching you. Think about that. That's exactly how I, I wouldn't be your pastor today. If I wasn't willing and, and I was too afraid to be strengthened and, and stretched by God. And maybe you're at that crossroads, and you're thinking, you know what, God, what, what, your objective, obviously, is to make me more like Christ, and that's going to involve stretching and growing and being strained just a little bit to step out in faith, and apparently that's pleasing to him. So take your opportunity, your open door to God, and ask for his confirmation. And through his word, through godly counsel from people you respect, his peace should be on the decision. You will have the assurance. You're not just mm, picking a door at random. I think I'll just choose that but you are actually walking towards a door that God is opening. And I can see so many light bulbs going off in your head right now because you're thinking through this. So let me ask the final question. What do you do while you're waiting at that open door? What do you do when you are in that uncomfortable DMV waiting room of God? Nobody likes that. Most of us think we're just wasting time, right? We don't like to wait. But God has the perfect timing. There's an old saying that says God is rarely early. <laughs> Don't you know? He's never late. He is always right on time. And the Hebrew word for being perfectly on time, that, that divinely chosen a fixed time, is moed. It's a beautiful word. It's packed with power. This is that divine, perfect word of, of faith where God says, this is the path for you. Walk ye in it. Your time is not yet, not yet, not yet. Go. That's it. That is that moed. And I love that because God is not hiding from you. He's not trying to hide his will. He's not being coy. I know everything for you, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> God's not a fickle 13-year-old. Yet we try to think, oh, well, he's just being coy with me. No, he's not. He's not. Seek him and you'll find him. Spend enough time seeking him and being earnest with him, and then he will be found. You can trust him, because when he promises something in his word, hear me, you can take it to the bank. It is legit. It is the real thing. And right now, you just may be in the waiting room. So remember this. When God has promised you something, it will come to pass. 
It will come to pass. Part of every believer's maturity involves waiting on God. And that is a sentence that's so powerful, you might want to write that down because we don't like that. Every believer's maturity will involve waiting on God. Think about the great examples. Think about Joseph. Think about David. Think about Moses, the one who walked with God, who was close to him. They still found themselves waiting. God told Moses, I'm going to use you to go deliver my people, and you're going to build and rebuild the Israel nation. It's going to be awesome, and I'm so excited, and we're going to go, and it's going to be fantastic. In fact, I'm going to lead you out in a blaze of glory. There's going to be plagues. Pharaoh's going to freak out. There's going to be an army coming. You're going to come up against the Red Sea. It's going to split. You're going to go through. They're not. They're going to die because the water's going to come back soon, and you're going to hurry up and wait 40 years after that. 40 years, on top of 400 in slavery. In cha- think about this. You think Israel was just a wee bit ready to get to the promised land? Yeah. So there's what they're thinking. They're marching. They're having a great time. They're going, we're going. We're singing the songs of Zion. It's going to be great. I love you. And we're having this time. We're walking. And they think two weeks, maybe four weeks, two months tops, and we're in the promised land. 40 years go by. That's longer than half of us have been alive. 40 years. Could you wait? Be honest. I don't wait 40 seconds for a parking spot at a restaurant. True story, right? I'll circle one time if it's my favorite. And if they don't have room to serve me, they don't get my business, (laughs) right? That's how I feel. Am I the only one? Don't, Don't you judge me. I feel your daggers. Listen, You've been there. I've watched you. You got your pH magnets. By the way, use your turn signal if you have a pH magnet, please. Just just throwing that out there. Here here is where the waiting, where the rubber meets the road in God's waiting room. Most of us are standing there and we think, well, I'm waiting in line at that restaurant again. And I don't want to wait. And so I guess I'm stuck doing nothing. (sighs) Hold your heads for your truth grenade for today. You are not just stuck doing nothing. What do you do while you're waiting? Well, let's put it in real life. Let's go back to the restaurant. I got my friendly neighborhood waiter right here. Here he is. It's your buddy and mine. He's at the Apex fancy restaurant, having a good time. He's a server. He's a waiter. The peak of good living, peak of high prices, peak of expensive meals. And he comes. Let, you know what? Let's make it even more real. You are this server, okay? That's you. Surprise! Now, you come up to your table that you've been assigned by your manager, and you come up to take the order for this table. And you can clearly see they're looking at their menus, and they don't have a clue what they're going to order. They haven't decided. They haven't even started talking about it. In fact, one kid's just playing little games, and they're ignoring you. And you come up, and you're like, do you know yet? So we just, we, we're not sure. Do you, as their server, take their menus from them and hit them on the head? <laughs> Say, are you a moron? Why do you not know? No, you don't do that. Do you, option B, pull up a chair and stare at them and say, do you know, 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 do you know yet? You know, you know, you do, you don't, you don't, you know, you know, no, what is wrong with you? You don't do that. Or option C, do you come up to them and say, I am so disappointed that you don't know that I'm going to stand here and I'm going to stare at you until you know. In fact, I am going to do nothing else. I'm going to stand right here and neglect all my other tables and stop serving them until you tell me what you want. Man, I hope you don't do that option. You don't do any of those because you're a good server. You know what a good server does? A good server says, I'll check back in with you. I'm going to go serve another table who's here and needs a meal. I'm going to give you a second so you can chew on that. No pun intended. I'm not going to stand here. I'm going to go. There is other customers here who need to be served a meal. Church, we should be doing the same thing. While we are waiting, we are to go and be serving God the entire time. There's no time to sit in neutral. Mm, I'm not going anywhere. I'll just sit here and waste gas. No. You have a mission. God is, you are surrounded with people who need your light all the time. We are never just sitting around waiting on something to happen. Waiting on him doesn't mean there's no movement. In fact, if you're waiting right now, you might know there's more movement right now than ever before. Which leads us to our closing scripture. Here is your challenge for the week. Whatever you are doing, 
whether it's words or deeds, whether it's actions, whatever, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is your challenge for the week. As you pray about these open doors, as you say, God, show me your calling, ask yourself these questions that we've talked to. This is where we find the Lord because he's not coy and he's not hiding it. Even when we don't understand what God is up to, may we continue to serve him. And in the meantime, do what needs to be done in your sphere of influence. Every day you have is a gift, and it is not a waste. Just because you're in God's waiting room doesn't mean you are wasting away. Look for areas to serve God right where you're at. Be the good server. Let's pray about it. Bow with me. God, I thank you for, again, the power of your word and the simplicity of truth. Truth that doesn't change due to whims or fads or goofy trends that come and go, but your truth is immutable, and it's steadfast, and it is the foundation we have chosen to build our life on. And I thank you, God, that you don't hide your will from us. I thank you that you've given us a foundation to stand on that is sure and strong and doesn't care about what the latest polls say or political correctness. Lord, you are truth. And Lord, we seek it, and we pray for clarity. We pray that you would light up the open door and that you would confirm it. God, for those who are hearing the sound of this prayer in this voice, I pray that you would reveal your truth to them, that you would tug on their heart, that you would reveal the passions you've given them, the giftedness you have for them, the special, unique qualities that you've given them, and that you would open that door, and that you would confirm it. God, help us not to waste any time, but to be busy until you come back. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen.